Hello and welcome to CAP number one, Language Systems. The first big idea for this first topic is that understanding how language works is essential to being able to teach reading and other literacy skills. The second big idea for this topic is that language, any language really, but in this case we're referring to English, is made up of systems. In this CAP, we will identify and define those systems and see how they work together to influence a person's literacy skills. Here's a graphic organizer for the systems of language and how they relate to literacy. The six circles on the ends of each spoke are the systems that make up English, as well as other languages. By the end of this video, you should be able to complete this graphic organizer with definitions for each system. Before we define those systems, let's define a couple of other important key terms first, expressive language and receptive language. Expressive language is how a message or idea is put together and then presented or expressed by the speaker. By that definition, you would think of spoken or written language as expressive language, but this also includes signed languages, pictures, symbols, and pictographs. Receptive language is how that message or idea is understood by someone other than the speaker. Receptive language skills are important in being able to decode and comprehend what's being expressed. Before you can read and comprehend written words and write meaningful text on a page, your oral, expressive, and receptive language skills are the key to communicating what you want and need. Now, let's take a look at each of those systems that make up language. Phonology is the sounds that are used to express language. This includes alphabetic sounds, or the sounds that each letter of the alphabet makes, which are called phonemes. Prosody and articulation are also components of phonology. These are not speech or alphabetic sounds particularly, but instead they have to do with intonation, pitch, and stressed and unstressed syllables. You'll see these terms again when you get to oral reading fluency. Morphology is breaking words apart in order to study the structures that create the word's meaning. Those pieces of words are called morphemes. Morphemes are word parts that are the smallest unit of meaning. Note that this is different from phonemes. Those have to do with units of sound. Morphemes are units of meaning. There are free morphemes and bound morphemes. Free morphemes can stand alone. Sometimes we call free morphemes base words or root words. Bound morphemes can't stand alone. Sometimes we call those affixes, which would include prefixes and suffixes. Here are some examples of free and bound morphemes. Let's go through an example of how to break down a word morphologically. This is also called morphemic analysis. This is an important skill in developing and expanding vocabulary later on. Let's look at the word thesis. The word thesis by itself is a free morpheme. It can't be broken down into any more individual meaningful parts. The word means a statement to be proved. So if we add a bound morpheme, hypo, to thesis, we get the new word, hypothesis, which has a different meaning now that we've added that bound morpheme to it. Notice how the separate meanings of those two morphemes in this word come together to make the meaning of the new word, hypothesis. Now let's add another bound morpheme, this time to the end of the word. This one, ize or eyes, is another bound morpheme. In this case, we're turning the noun hypothesis into a verb hypothesize. Once again, we've also changed the meaning of the new word by adding this new morpheme to it. Semantics is the system that connects background or previously learned knowledge to what you are currently reading or listening to in order to construct new knowledge. Semantics can apply to the meaning of words or the meaning of full sentences. You may have heard of schemas or schema theory. A schema is another term for previously learned knowledge or concepts that you use as a foundation for understanding new knowledge or concepts. Lots of recent research has shown that readers' control and use of semantics or these schema is key for comprehending what they read. Orthography is defined as the system of writing, but it really consists of what's called graphemes, which are usually letters of the alphabet. Really, letters and combinations of letters are symbols that represent a unique phoneme or speech sound. So writing has to do with connecting the speech sound to the letter. 
Connecting phonemes to graphemes is one of the most important milestones in literacy development in younger children. Any of the 26 letters of the English alphabet, and sometimes combinations of letters, are considered graphemes. With phonemes, though, the key thing to remember is that a phoneme is capable of changing the word completely, not just the meaning, changing the whole word, if it is removed or changed. Let's try an example of this. Take a look at the word wake. If you change any of those phonemes, you'll get a different word with a different meaning, or you'll get a nonsense but still pronounceable word. So, if you change the first consonant phoneme to sn, you get snake. If you change the first vowel sound in the word wake to o, you get the word woke. Your ability to notice and understand these changes as they're happening and to understand the new words that could be formed by removing, adding, or changing those phonemes is called phonemic awareness. And we'll cover that a lot more in later videos. Next up is syntax. Syntax, like morphology, has to do with structures, but instead of looking at the structure of individual words, syntax is how words are combined into larger language structures like phrases and sentences. Syntax is what determines grammar or the rules of word order and sentence structure. This is important because these rules and structures help readers and listeners comprehend effectively, efficiently, and accurately. Here are some examples of why understanding syntax is important to comprehension and effective communication skills. Because there are those rules that govern word order in English, this first sentence doesn't make much sense and is not easily understood. But the second sentence, with the exact same words in a different order, one that follows standard English grammar and syntax, does make sense. We can also rearrange the sentence again, and then this time, thanks to punctuation, the sentence can still make sense. The last component of oral language structure is pragmatics. Pragmatics is how language is used in order to communicate, understand, address, and satisfy needs. In other words, pragmatics has to do with the social function of language. This sounds like an advanced literacy skill, but if you think about it, even babies and toddlers understand how to use language of some kind to communicate their needs. This table breaks down the various pragmatics or social functions of language. You can explore more about these on your own. There are a whole coursework you can do. There's a whole field of study on social functions of language, but the main thing to know at this point is that pragmatics is what children learn when they realize that they can get needs met through language. Now, to bring all of this together and look at it chronologically, here's another graphic that shows the timeline of how we acquire and master a first or native language. And this process looks a little bit different when we're talking about learning a second or even third language. Some of the systems we've learned about so far are part of very early oral language development, which are shown on the left-hand side. Early speech, vocabulary starts building and begins to grow, some phonology and phonological awareness develops, and eventually there's some understanding of basic syntax. Next, the child moves into early stages of developing the literacy skills that will lead to reading, and then the key skills that children develop in these stages rely on the foundations built from their oral language development. This expansion of skills continues to grow as literacy development becomes more advanced or adult-like. How might any significant weaknesses or gaps anywhere in this progression affect a child's later literacy development? Now let's review what we covered in this video. We focused on these two big ideas and we went over definitions and examples for the six systems of language. Each of those is going to come up again and again. And here again is that graphic organizer for this topic. Now that you know more about these systems of language, you can see how any weaknesses or gaps in any of those skill areas can have a significant effect on the development of later literacy skills. They're also key to the development of expressive and receptive language, which we also defined in this video. And that's all for this topic. Thanks for watching.